What is up, Stockton, California? This is 93.5 KWDC Delta College Radio, and I'm your girl, Carolita. And this is your boy, Choi. We got the mayor leaking up in the building. What's up? What's up, 209? <laughs> we out of here. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what is up, Stockton? We are back for part two. The conversation was so good, we had to come back for more. Um, we started off getting to know the mayor, but we jumped right into the deep end, getting into policies and programs. So we want to go back to getting to know more about you. So what's up? What's up? Well, I'm here. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's do this. Is there something um, that I'm going to go right into it, right? I'm going to get right into it. Mm-hmm. Like there's something that maybe we haven't asked uh, that you want to share a little bit about yourself that maybe the people don't know. He thinks he's Steph Curry. I'm like <laughs> Steph Curry with the shot. <laughs> how was your game? First of all, how was how was your ball was game? Like, how was your handle? Go. Right. So, what position were you playing? So in basketball, mm-hmm. I played the three. It was a small forward. We had a pretty big lineup, and I was always known for my jump shot. And really, uh, my sweet spot was 15 foot range as well. What was what was your numbers? Oh man, I have to go back in the archive regarding those stats, but uh, I was probably we're gonna fact check this. You know that, right? We're exactly, gonna fact check this. Exactly, exactly. Shots all scrolling down on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> so I was a very one of the most consistent free throw shooters, though. Uh, in fact, um, I attended a basketball camp at Stag when I was mm. in high school, and um, uh, I competed in the free throw contest. I think I was a it was the summer of my freshman year against a, a senior. And ultimately, it just came down to sudden death, right? Who would miss the first shot first? And um, I came in second place, but... I was about to say, you were like Shaq. Yeah, no, no, no. Like- <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was great, super competitive. Came in second place. Um, got the uh, most outstanding camper um, trophy and stuff. And so it was pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, I, I love playing basketball, uh, football as well. So in high school, I was a tight end and wide receiver. I can see the wide receiver though. I couldn't like the tight end. Like tight ends are like some some of them was just beefy. Well, yeah, that's like, that's today's, today's tight generation end. Yeah, tight yeah, end. Yeah, we're talking about high school, high school, so, well over twenty years ago. Which one's you? your favorite? Was that football or basketball? Basketball is my favorite. Basketball. Mm-hmm. Do you yeah. watch it, or are you like a consistent watcher? Because I know I play softball. I if don't I watch had it. if I had time to watch it consistently. I would. Do you go to the high school games? I I don't. I do go to the high school games. I don't have time to consistently watch Mm -hmm. uh, pro basketball, but I do have time to go to the high school games. You have a team? High school games. Right. You have a team that you uh, root for? Uh, I'm a Lakers fan. Uh LeBron. I'm a Lakers fan. LeBron James. So a Lakers fan. I like LeBron James, uh, but my favorite basketball player is Magic Johnson. That's the generation that, that I grew up with. Yeah. Yeah, the 92 Dream Team. Magic Johnson. He's really magical. Let's, okay. <laughs> he is. What? <laughs> that, that sounded like shots fired. No, like, what, he is. is he? <laughs> uh, when I go to LA, the first thing I go to is uh, uh, TJI Fridays that he owns. Like, I'm trying to be like really in the mix. So he is. <laughs> 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 but like you do way too much. Right. I go get my little drink at TGI Friday. Uh, it's like magic on it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> But this is about the mayor. This ain't about you though. I'm a, Thank I'm, you for bringing that back. I'm full I'm circle. Bring that I back appreciate to, that. Because she'll go off on her own all day. She will have no problem. About me. Right. <laughs> I love you for that. <laughs> uh, so so okay, you you play you were you you play sports, right? Like, what other things? Fishing is big around here. I fishing? know fishing is, yeah, fishing is big. Yeah, my fiance fishes. I hate yeah, it. Yeah, it's like, like any other extracurricular Out- activities outside of, outside. you know, uh, maybe school sports or any, like anything you partook in. You can go hunting on Lo- in Lodi, too. As a young man, I grew up in Stockton Parks and Recs. Mm-hmm. That's just the facts. Um, day camps, going to Oak Park, um, the swimming pool. The whole nine, uh, playing year round, uh, compet- you know, sports, uh, not only competitively uh, through like an AAU team, but also just the winter, the summer, the fall leagues uh, for park- Stockton Parks and Recreation. She only do sports, no outside. We're like in farmland. I never got into <laughs> fishing. 
hunting. Uh, even though we have a big fishing community and a, and a big boating yeah, community, yeah. I mean, we we have the Delta, right? Exactly. And so it's it, it's amazing. I never got into that. Um, never really got into the outdoors as well, no. like camping uh, and things of that nature. Have uh, you have you gone camping though? But I've gone camping. Yeah, I've done it. But it's horrible. It's not something that. Like I look forward to every season. Right, it's horrible. <laughs> not That's that there's why. anything wrong with it, but it's just not not my thing. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. likes going glamping. <laughs> what is glamping. what is glamping? <laughs> yeah, can you can you clarify <laughs> that? <laughs> cabin. That? Like we're not going Explain in the dirty old. We're gonna be like in a cabin, cute where there's like water running and like electricity. <laughs> but who go? But who goes camping? Cute. Like you, go, you have to go. You have to go with the mindset. Like, okay, no. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be dusty okay. for the next two days. I think we're getting no. off track. Here. Can we bring this back to me? <laughs> yeah, please. Please. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going camping. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, well, camping. Like, did you like? Isn't that like army? You're in the army, right? And that's what I was gonna say. I did a lot of, a lot of, quote unquote, camping in mm-hmm. the Marine Corps. Yeah. Uh, as part of our training exercises and things mm-hmm. of that nature. Can you, Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit of, uh, about your experience uh, uh, in the Army? In the Marines? Marine Corps. In the I Marine Corps. Think. So mm-hmm. I was raised in the Army back because my stepfather, my father, he, he raised me yeah. since the time I was five. Um, and he's been married to my mother for 37 years. Um, but, yeah, so I grew up in, the, in an Army home for, for several years. Joined the Marine Corps when I was 20. Uh months before 9-11 took place. As soon as 9-11 hit, you know, the whole world changed. Um, I was actually in the military police academy getting ready to graduate. I was recruited to go work for the White House military office uh, as a military police officer attached to Marine One, which is the president's helicopter. So that big green helicopter that the president flies on with the white top. Yeah. Uh, I was assigned to that. My job was to protect that presidential asset, the helicopter. Uh, he had the president has a secret service that protects him. So wherever the president traveled, uh, myself and other Marines, that's where we traveled, whether it was foreign or domestic. So once in a lifetime experience, incredible opportunity, uh, was blessed as a result of it. So that was my military For which president? George W. Bush. How was that? Like, um, did you get to like talk to him and he talked to you? <laughs> did, did Secret Service, he did, just did, Secret Service like, did, did they even let you get close? Right. Enough? <laughs> <laughs> so I had I had three conversations with him, personal conversations with him. Uh, two of them were at Camp David, which is the presidential retreat, and uh, one of them was in the Oval Office with my wife before I um, got out of the Marine Corps. There was an opportunity for my wife to go in and have a conversation with them, take a photo with them. Um, and so that, that was a great, great experience. And it was an honor to serve our country. Yeah. So you protected the helicopter or him? I protected the helicopter that he flew on. Okay. Because that's the presidential <laughs> yeah, we, asset. Right. You have you ever seen Passenger 57? I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> Not Passenger 57. <laughs> uh, 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 um, oh, I forget what. Never mind. Nope, We're going to cut that out. Okay? I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> We're going to so. cut that out. I was I was thinking about the one uh, um, the with the um, Air Force One that movie with the Air Force One. Oh, I don't pay attention to that. Yeah, no, never mind. We gonna cut that out. <laughs> 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 so then, after the military or after um, the Marine Corps, I keep calling it the military because I know they're different, right? No, so the military consists of different. The United States military consists of several different branches. The Marine Corps is one of those branches. Of the military. Okay. So after you did the Marine Corps and uh, was in Marine One protecting the asset, <laughs> and then you worked in Silicon Valley, right? How was that? It was an incredible experience, uh, and, and that was my first experience in the corporate world because ultimately I was, was the district manager for the private security company. So my job was to retain and grow the business. And so as a district manager, I had a dedicated business development manager. And uh, my f- I had a district support staff of 21 employees. I had two district offices, one in San Jose on North First Street and one in San Mateo. And uh, I had over 1,300 employees that serviced our many clients in the Silicon Valley. Uh, so that was my role there. It was a corporate leadership 
executive type of role. How was how was the transition? Like, so being you know being uh, um, from the military to corporate America. Like was it was it a smooth transition? Was there anything that you struggled with? Was there anything that because you know it must have been like a new right? This is a new environment. So like, how did you handle that? Is it less tense? I think there's a different type of intensity mm-hmm. in the in the corporate sector versus the uh, military versus even government where I'm leading now. Uh, but uh, I, I'd say. Uh, the principles, the discipline, the focus, the work ethic that I had in the military, I was uh, able to apply that 100% to uh, my role uh, in my leadership capacity uh, in corporate America. And then I transitioned, you know, after working in corporate America for eight years uh, to a local nonprofit, a local church as their executive administrator uh, that oversaw, you know, the organization, the finances, the staff and the implementation of vision. And again, I was able to provide my, apply my experience in the corporate sector and in the military to even that role. And then you fast forward and today, now I'm the mayor. After doing that with the nonprofit, the local church for seven and a half years, now I'm the mayor of Stockton. And so I'm applying again all those previous experiences to the role that I have today. So uh, for me, uh, it's been about just constant development, constant growth and applying my experiences to that next opportunity. Where, where does that drive come from? Right? The motivation and to, to always grow and develop, right? Going from military to corporate America, to nonprofit, to now being a mayor, right? Like, the drive that get you know like this is the path I'm going on. Gotta be dedicated. Yeah. The hard work was modeled for me through my stepfather, my father that that raised me. Um, he was one of the hardest. He is the, one of the hardest working men that I knew. Uh, I didn't know anything different. Right. He always worked hard, even when we struggled and didn't, you know, felt like we didn't have enough money to make it to the end of the month. Right. We worked a little bit. He worked harder. He just modeled. He was that role model. For me in in what he did and that's that that was the seed for everything for me and then we always gave back always gave back at a young age and i remember as 16 17 years old on saturdays i would go out to the california youth authority uh, and i would encourage my peers that were incarcerated um, and and just speak life into them um, because I, where I didn't make some of those choices and I didn't find myself in that position, I felt like I could, I could relate from the standpoint that my biological father, you know, uh, made poor choices and wasn't a part of my life. And so uh, there was some, to me, I felt there was a nexus there. There was a connection there. Yeah. And, and that was formative in my life. So I would say if you look back over my different careers and my growth and my development over the years, there's a common denominator, and that is it's been all about service. It's been all about what I can do uh, to help somebody and make a visible difference in their life in the environments that I find myself in. Is that because of where you grew up? It's because of those values that were instilled in me. Oh, from your uh, stepfather? From, from my stepfather, from my mother, mm-hmm. um, and from all, also from those mentors uh, in my childhood, uh, some of them were coaches, mm. um, some of them were teachers that that spoke that life into me and, and encouraged me and said that I could accomplish things. I was an average student in high school uh, and just um, in school in general. Um, I, 2.0, 2.6. What was, what was your favorite subject? <laughs> PE. PE. Oh, wow. <laughs> I always, never got, failed, always never, got an A in PE. Yeah. Can't Go never figure. fail PE. I yeah. always failed PE. I was opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and I was playing sports too, which is crazy. <laughs> but when I, you know, I, I pursued my college, my higher education goals mm-hmm. later on in life. So I was 27, 28 when I first got my associate's degree. I was uh, 35 when I got my bachelor's degree. I was 40 when I received my master's degree. So I didn't 
take the traditional route. But when I decided to pursue higher education, I was ready. I was committed. And I realized um, I did have what it take to be successful. And, and I was a 3.8 and above student throughout college. We're going to take a break right now real quick. But we're going to come back. Okay, on the topic of being an adult in school and getting your AA at 28, right? 28, you said? 28. 28. So I'm the same way. I got my first AA at 28. I'm getting my second one. I'm 30. And then I'm going to move on to a four-year. I'm not going to say the four-year yet because I'm a little nervous. But (laughs) so I can relate to you on that point. What made you go back to school at a younger or older age? I had a young family. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I... We just had our second child, a daughter, and um, I wanted to be able to provide a, 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 a different life for my family that I had, was offered growing up, and in the career that I was pursuing, in the opportunities that I wanted to ultimately obtain and achieve, I needed to get, I needed to get my education. I needed to get an associate's degree in business. If I was going to be successful in the corporate sector, I needed to, I needed to get my associate's, associate's degree in business. I needed to eventually get my bachelor's degree in business management, and then I needed to get my master's degree in executive leadership. You had, you had to level up. I yeah. had to level up. Yeah. And, and I remember my daughter was maybe 18 months old at the time when I first got my associate's. My son was three. And... I remember there were nights I would fall asleep at the dinner table and like wake up in the middle of the night or wake up the next morning because I was working on a paper. Uh, but my inspiration were, were my kids. Sounds like uh, my life. Yeah. I have my kids at 23. I have a, right now they're seven and four. One's turning four on Sunday. But um, very much that's how my life is. I'm, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, well, I need to buckle down and find out what I need to do because I was very much average. And then I found this wonderful place and I started getting 4.0s every semester. Mm. So it's like good to hear that I can relate to you in certain parts of where you're coming from. So thank you. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. What would, you, what would you say would be your proudest moment as a parent? My proudest moment as a parent is, well, let me back up. So I'm first generation in my family to, to graduate from college. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and, but my, so that was never modeled for me growing up in, in, and that's maybe why just because I wasn't exposed to it. That's maybe why I didn't achieve certain academic milestones in my, in my childhood. But my proudest moment now as a father is my children being able to experience the journey. See, they they went to dad commencement ceremonies. Mm-hmm. Um, they walked away from my commencement ceremony um, when I got my master's degree saying, I want to go here. Um, they're putting in the work themselves without me having to really push them because I modeled that for them, and their mother modeled that for them. And that's a, that's a proud moment for, for me. That's one of the proudest moments for me. So I like to say, uh, I got into this college last night, and I told my daughter, and she started jumping up and down for me. So I understand where you're coming from, where mm-hmm. they actually feel proud for you, and they see it, and that, like, my daughter's like, I want to be a YouTuber like you. I'm like, I'm not a YouTuber, but, yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> and what I tell my kids is, don't just want to be like me, be better than me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it's my job as your father. I have this conversation with my 16, soon to be 16 and 17 year old right now. I tell them any opportunity that I get, it's my job to give you everything that I have in the model as much as I can for you. Because my ceiling will be your platform and should be your platform for growth in life. Every generation should build upon the next. My parents did the best that they could mm-hmm. to provide for me with, with the tools and the resources that they were given. It's my job to take that to the next level. And I yeah. believe that I have. And then, then it's their While job. honoring yeah. the work that they did. And, and then do that, you know, pay it forward with, with my kids as well, right? That's, that's how we create legacy. That's how we create generational 
wealth and growth. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of sense that, you know, you, you got a little emotional talking about, you know, little, you know, the proud moments, right? How, uh, uh, where, where is that, what is that emotion and, and where does that come from? It's genuine love, gratitude, uh, humility, but recognizing the magnitude of the responsibility as a father. Mm -hmm. And that's why I spend so much time in these schools getting as much face time as I can with students is because I'm living that right now in my own household. Yeah. And so I can connect with students in a way that some others can't connect. One is because my story as a child is probably not much different than theirs, and I want to share that with them. I want them to know that, man, if he could struggle or if he's gone through things and he's where he's at, I could do the same thing, and I'm going to let them know that they could do it better than me. So the same message I tell my own children, my own students in my house, I share that message with other students throughout the city every opportunity I get. That's beautiful. I see we just, I'm like, we could just end on that. That's it, that's it. boom. But no, I, no, we still no, got no, more no, to go, though. No, 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 I'm saying we still got more to go. <laughs> so California is a democratic state, right? We're just going to switch gears real quick. Now, California is a democratic state. What made you run as a Republican in this democratic state? And what has affected your career, political career, as a Republican? What we need to understand about local politics and the governing structure for the city of Stockton is that it's nonpartisan. So I don't know what that means. Nonpartisan means that when I'm running for office as mayor, or if there's a council member that's running for a council district to represent the city, on that ballot, there's not a R or a D or any other letter next to that name. Okay. Our responsibility as elected representatives for the city of Stockton is to make decisions that are in the best interest of the community that we were elected to serve. Uh, and so that's how I lead. I don't lead with an R or a D or any other letter next to my name. I lead with the interests of the people first. That's why I'm able to have conversations in different spaces with different factions, different organizations, different groups in the city is because I'm willing to set a table, I'm willing to have a conversation with you because I care about what this city looks like when I'm gone, okay? So that means it's not about me. It's not about me. And, and what, happens in lo we, we, what happens in local politics when we allow partisan views and interests to come into to play, it creates dysfunction, walls of division. We need to be creating bridges in our community and tearing down walls so that our our community of Stockton that is, has experienced a lot of trauma on so many different levels uh, for decades and, and generations, uh, we, could, we could begin to heal. And that's what I'm committed to is that healing process while I'm there. Would you think because you're able to sit down, like basically speak to both sides, let's say, I know you don't look at all that, but like, let's say you speak to both sides, would that make you like more moderate Absolutely. By definition, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you think? What you'll find is that when you actually sit down with a person or a group and have a conversation with them. It ain't, what, it ain't about R&D and no. like what, 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 what you're right going to find is that we have more in common. Yep. Than we do, yeah. Than we don't. Mm -hmm. We just have to be willing to have that conversation. Yeah. And, and oftentimes that political affiliation or that designation prevents us from even having the conversation. Right. And in local politics, that's unacceptable, especially in local politics, that's unacceptable because all politics is, is, lo is, is local and the biggest change that we can make and the biggest impact that our communities experience and have to live with are those decisions that are made locally because they affect them on a daily basis. I feel, I feel like just talking about just talking about this with you right now and you know you being open and being vulnerable and sharing some you know some of the uh, um your stories right i can get a i can for me personally like i can get a sense of you know the drive and the passion that you have for politics and policy from your childhood right 
from the, the 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 values that was ingrained and 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 embedded in you, right? You know, and so like, can you can you say more about how you know your childhood or how you were raised play into maybe the decision making uh, um, policy aspect of of your line of work? I'll tell you that what I've tried to be intentional about all my life is embracing the the tough times and the challenging times in my childhood um, and even into my adulthood, um, embracing those because those challenging, those tough times, those failures, those setbacks, uh, I was intentional about, I try to be as intentional as I can about learning from them to make, to make me better, right? And, and to me, that's what it's, that's what it's been all about. Okay, so we're going to change it a little bit more. Not, not really that much, but, like, according to Bloomberg, right, the newest mayors are more diverse and younger. Do you think that plays a role into how you politic Cal- uh, Stockton? Well, I can say that I'm probably pretty diverse because I'm half Mexican and half black. Um, younger, I'm 40, 42, so I'd probably fit that that description from that. No no gray hairs yet? Bloomberg no study. Hair yet. No gray hairs yet. You can yeah, pass I have, for a, like I have, a, okay. I have a few coming <laughs> coming through on my chin chin chin, but um, but does, yeah. Does it play a role, like be, um, being younger and more diverse? Does it play a role with how you in Stockton? I believe it does play a role. Um, it does play a role because I am a mayor that's representative of the community that he's been elected to serve. The average age of a Stocktonian is thirty nine years old. I'm 42. I was 40 when I took office. Okay, um, we have a thir- oh, about 30 percent of our population is under the age of of 18 years of age. Old. I have two students of my own that are 17 and soon to be 16. Um, half of almost half, 46 percent of our community. Uh, English is the second language that they speak at home. I'm the grandson of a Mexican immigrant that s- the primary language spoken in my mother's home was Spanish. So I can relate to th- the community <coughs> as a whole. So because I can relate, be- I make decisions that take those things into consideration because I want what's best for our community. The vision of of our city right now is that Stockton will be the best city in America to live, raise a family, and grow a business. And that's what I'm committed to. That sounds like a tall mountain to climb. No? Tank it's half full. Tank, <laughs> tank half full. <laughs> tank half full. Because in that, the, the tank half full is that I don't climb that mountain by myself. The, the community helps. We climb the mountain together. Right. Like when I was in the Marine Corps, we 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 say we had the term of take that mountain. We don't take that mountain by ourselves. We don't overcome that challenge, that obstacle by the, ourselves. We do it together. There's no nationality, there's no, we don't look at race, we don't look at age, we don't look at your socioeconomic status. What we know is that we have this mission together, we have this goal that, you know, that we want to accomplish, and, and we're going we're gonna to take that mountain together. And ultimately, if we stick together, we stay together, we're going to get there. I wish we learned that in school. That the teamwork more type stuff, but do you think like the diversity and your your youth? The, do you think um, I lost my train of thought? Oh, do you think you're, you're being held to a different standard because of your youth and your diversity? Do you think that they the community expects more out of you? I think the community expects a lot out of me because I'm the mayor. Um, because the mayor that. I, this community should expect, right? They 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 voted for me, so um, I don't think me personally, 
I, I don't think because of my ethnicity or my age that the community expects more out of me. I just think because I'm the mayor, they expect me to make decisions that are in the best interest of the entire community. And so, you know, you get back to the whole partisan issue of the R and, and, and the D. Whether you voted for me or not, based off of party lines, I'm your mayor. The majority of the people of this city said, hey, we want to take a shot with Kevin Lincoln to be the mayor. When I took office, I don't just serve the majority of those people who voted for me. I serve all 322,000 people in this community, whether you voted for me or not. That's what it's about. And we're going to work hard to deliver for the people. Last question. What do, um, what should some people of Stockton, or what should people know of Stockton? What should the people of Stockton know more about you that they wouldn't expect to know? That sometimes I get hangry. <laughs> hey, what, you, say, you said hangry? Hangry. Hangry. Like if I don't eat, <laughs> then, you know, I, I might get a little hangry. So it might be time for me to eat. You're right. no. <laughs> Somebody get him a sandwich. <laughs> Give me some chocolate. I like chocolate. chocolate. I like Milk chocolate. chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk chocolate. Okay. Yeah. So, so, would that be, so would that be like your guilty pleasure? Chocolate. Chocolate? Chocolate. chocolate. Okay. And cookies. cookies. You don't get a whole batch of chocolate cookies. at your door. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all heard that stocking. Y'all, y'all want, y'all, y'all want something done? Get the mayor some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll share it with everyone. <laughs> share it with everyone. <laughs> Thank you for listening to All Nine Talk. That is the end of our first episode. If I need to redo that, I can do that. Yes. <laughs> You, just, you say first episode. Just, I don't know what it is. Just, just no. say it, in, in, end of our show. Thank you for that. Was the end of two hundred nine talk. Thank you for everyone that is listening, and make sure you tune in on ninety three point five. Watch us on YouTube, and that is the end of our show. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. <laughs> yee. <laughs> Not ye. <I'm> <laughs> what in the stocking is going on? <laughs> <laughs> 209 Talk has been a production of KWDC 93.5 LPFM, Delta College Radio. This program is made possible by listeners like you. Programming is produced by the students, staff, and faculty of San Joaquin Delta College's Digital Media Department. It is supported by the Delta College Department of Arts, Humanities, and Multimedia, the Career Technical Education and Workforce Development Office, and the State of California. This is a collaboration with the City of Stockton Mayor's Office. Thank you for listening.